winds of change are blowing through Raider Nation. And Silver and Black Today keeps you up to date with the latest news and views about your Las Vegas Raiders. Touchdown, Las Vegas! With insight, opinions, and interviews. We're on the cutting edge of what's happening now. Now, now with the latest on your Raiders and the NFL. Your host, Scott Goldbranson and Mo Moten. All right, here we're back. Yes, we're back in the flesh. Scott Branson, Mo Moten. This is Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Two weeks to go until the NFL draft. We're running through positions. And again, want to introduce you to my co-host, my partner here on the show. That is Mr. Mo Moten, senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com. You can follow him and interact with him and feel his wrath at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. You can find me at LV Gully, as well as you can read my work uh, and watch my work up on sportsnot.com, in addition to what we do here with the Raiders. And we're just forging ahead with draft co- draft, draft coverage. Jeez, I got to start talking better, Mo. What's going on here? Blah, 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 blah. All right, we're good. So draft coverage now. We're just two weeks away. We've been through quarterbacks. We've been through the offensive line. We talked through defensive line. Now we're to defensive backs. We're going to talk cornerbacks and safeties today. And uh, we will make some assumptions like we did last time. We'll explain that to you in just a minute. I'm always interested, Mo, last time on the show on Tuesday, as usually we premiere the show, and I'm always in the chat live talking with our listeners. And um, a lot of folks were were saying, we need offensive linemen. We don't need we don't need defensive linemen. And it was really interesting because I, you, everybody's got their opinion and they're all valid because it's your opinion. But I, I'm surprised that because the defense did so well last year towards the end of the year, people think like because Christian Wilkins is now inside that they're good. And I was trying to explain to them, no. John Jenkins, those guys are good players, but you can always see a depth. But we always talk about it here, Mo, and I want you to touch on this, and that is good young players on rookie contracts, right? Not only that, but defensive line is one of the position groups where you – I think I said it during the show that you're going to probably need five or six guys in rotation. Right. And that includes – and I'm including, you know, a defensive tackle you may have on the practice squad – because there are injuries, obviously. We don't want anyone to get hurt. But if you've been watching football long enough, you know that most teams have about five or six interior linemen that they rotate in and out based on the situation, pass rushers, run stoppers, uh, players who are a combination of the two. So I think we said this and we made this clear on Tuesday's show that we don't expect the Raiders to draft a defensive lineman in, within the first two rounds at the earliest, maybe the third round. And that's why we we didn't touch on the top prospects. This is why we didn't touch uh, we didn't talk too much about Byron Murphy the second because he's probably, you know, at at the latest uh, early second round pick. So we talked about guys that could go in the fourth, fifth, maybe even sixth round, and and that's what that's what we tried to do on Tuesday show. Exactly, and and that's the assumptions we make, and and I think a lot of people got it when I was explaining it because I wasn't. You have a different opinion. I'm cool with it. I'm not mad about it. I mean, it's your opinion. You're entitled to it. So, but I was trying to explain the premise, which we explained in the show. Of course, uh, our viewers on YouTube are awesome because they come to the show a few minutes before it starts and they start chatting even before. Why are you talking about defensive linemen? So it was good to be able to do that. And now we're going to talk about a need that I know Raider fans understand. It might not be need number one or two, but it's, it's need number three in my book. And that is at cornerback. The Jack Jones signing last year obviously worked out well so far. If he continues to play like he did last year, then they're good. They need someone else on the outside. They got the they got the slot good, right? I mean, and 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 you have Jacorian Bennett there as a developmental talent as well. So when we look at this too, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to mention one guy only because the only way I see the Raiders surprise us. I really believe this outside of trading up for a quarterback um, or, or whatnot is, is taking a cornerback in the first round. I think the chances of that happening are very, very slim, very slim. 
So I'm going to mention one guy at the top of the draft from a cornerback because the cornerback class is A plus this year. It is really, really deep. Guys you're going to get in the third or fourth round, Mo, which we're going to talk some about some of these guys too, are, are quality players, right? I mean, yes, they're not first rounders. They're not the Kool-Aid McKinstries or the Quinion Mitchells and those guys, but they're pretty good. And I look, the more I looked into that class, I'm like, dang, there is a lot of value. Now, some of those guys might move up into the second round when there's runs or people are are making deals and moving around. But um, when you look at this class, very, very impressive. Very impressive. Uh, there are two names specifically at the top that are going to be mocked to the Raiders probably at 13. But as you mentioned, and, I, and I've done mock draft simulations, I don't like to talk about mock drafts too much to uh, <laughs> saturate the market for mock draft. <laughs> but in doing those, not to say that that's going to be what happens on draft day, but it's very clear that you could probably go four rounds deep and get a starter at some point. I, I don't think they're ready to wait to the fourth or fifth round to get a uh, cornerback to potentially mm -hmm. actually start. But I'd say it's a possibility in the second round. I, I've written in multiple columns now said on multiple shows that and i'm gonna make this very clear if you're listening raider nation tom telesco has only drafted a cornerback in the first round once in 11 years yep. once in 11 years and that was jason verrett in 2014 with the chargers since then he's 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 waited to day two day three to draft a cornerback most of the time i a lot of times he likes to Sign veteran cornerbacks. I talked mm -hmm. about that in my piece last week on Sports Not about some of the veterans he's picked up in Los Angeles with, with San Diego, now Los Angeles Chargers. Brandon Flowers, Casey Hayward. He tried JC uh, JC Jackson. It didn't work. But he typically likes veteran cornerbacks and guys in on day two of the draft. So we'll talk about some of those guys today. Absolutely yes, uh, and and there's there's good ones, and I've picked out some. I know you'll you'll have some probably similarities, but you'll also have your own uh, that I don't have listed. But we're going to go through that, and that's the way I looked at it. Mo was third round, possibly bottom of second. They could trade, depending what they do. You know, if you get an extra second round pick, some of these guys could move up into the bottom of the second. But some of these are third and and fourth rounders, and like you said, could start in the NFL right away. So I think that 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 is good for the Raiders because at a position of need, they have a very 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 deep draft, and I like that. And of course, the guy I was most impressed with, and this is going to be a first rounder, so I don't think it plays into the cards for the Raiders, which is Terry on Arnold. I was so impressed with him not only because of his physical attributes and what he did, but his leadership. And and his just the the kind of feeling you got around being around the young man, he's going to be a good one. Um, and just hope he doesn't go into the AFC West uh, against the Raiders. But for me, Mo, I'm going to start with a guy that I like and I think will be there uh, when the Raiders are turning to this need. Uh, and and it could he could move up a little bit. There was some good talk about him, which is Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia, six foot one eighty six, thirty one tackles, four assists, fifteen stops. He had two pass breakups. Now this year, I didn't have any interceptions. This year, though, uh, his his quarterback um, rating as far as targeting was a little higher than usual. So that's kind of pushed him down a little bit. A lot of people liked Lasseter last year as well. But I like him, too, because I think he's the kind of guy who can play outside, keep up with the modern NFL wide receiver, and um, he's very quick in transition. So when you get those coverages and you get uh, um, um, some of the plays that you see in the NFL today, he's do that. He's also really good tackler. You know, people forget about that with cornerbacks. Mo is tackling, right? We've seen some pretty bad tackling Raider teams over the last four or five years. It got much better last year. But we saw some of that. And I think that when you're looking at cornerbacks, yeah, you're looking at the coverage, you're looking at all that stuff, but you also have to look at that. That's the reason like uh, I like Kamari Lasseter. Kamari Lasseter, um, I guess the knock against him would be ball production, I yep. guess. Yep. Uh, as you I briefly mentioned, you know, lack of interceptions. But when you look at cornerbacks, I think you have to be careful about counting interceptions. Because, you know, pass breakups are also important. You also have to look at how many targets that player is getting on a collegiate level. A lot of times a Google cornerback isn't going to see a lot of targets because, the you know, the quarterback is just going to avoid that player and throw to the other side of the field, whoever that is. But uh, I'll talk about Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon. Ah. That's a guy that I've talked about uh, before the before the combine. And I yeah. think not that he's overlooked, but coming into the draft evaluation process, he was overlooked because he's only a one-year starter. Uh, he was at, you know, he was at a junior college. 
was a JUCO uh, player, was at Alabama, didn't get a starting job there, then then transferred, moved to Oregon, and got to got some play time and showed out once he got on the field. So I think his upside is very high because he's still learning. He's still learning to play the position from an experienced perspective, right? So he's not again. He's not a two three year starter, but from what you saw last year from him at Oregon, you can see the upside in him. And he's a six three, about one ninety five cornerback. Yeah. So while Patrick Graham usually doesn't go for bigger cornerbacks, he could be the replacement for Brendan Faison, who's about six two over 200 pounds. So if I'm looking at a, at a guy who can be that replacement and be the, the size complement to Jack Jones, Jack Jones went on uh, the X recently and says he's over six feet. We'll, we'll give him that. We'll just say, we'll just say, yeah, Jack, you're over six feet. We'll see. He deserves you know. that. He deserves you know, you put whatever you want in your driver's license. You can say whatever you want on Twitter <laughs> and the X, but I think the Raiders need some size on the outside and Kyrie Jackson gives them that size and length on, on the perimeter. I love Kyrie Jackson, uh, Mo. And I mean, you look at last year, uh, 12 games, 26 tackles, seven assists, 12 stops. Uh, he had eight pass breakups, three interceptions. So you talk about the ball ability there. And um, not only that, the QB rating was 41.6, which is a very good one. And he had six pressures and two sacks. That's the thing I like about him, too. He is good as a blitzer as well. Yeah. So that gives you a lot of opportunity there as well. He's really, he's, he's good in press man coverage. He also is, I was talking about it earlier with Lassiter. He's also a good tackler, right? And again, so you look at him, he, you know, he's, he's got an eagerness about him. Like he wants physical, um, he wants physicality. He wants, he wants to hit. And so I think you look at, what kind of mentality and attitude and culture the Raiders are building, especially on defense, building off of last year. He's a guy who fits in really, really well. And that ball tracking ability, which you talked about being maybe a little bit of a downside for Lassiter, Jackson is good. And you look at this and, you know, every player has things they have to work on. It just blows my mind that this class is so deep that we're talking about a guy because he's, yes, he's 6'4", 190 or 6'3", 190. But, he's not a guy who plays like an overly big cornerback. You know what I mean? He plays much more like a guy, six, one, six foot. I, he just seems much more fluid than some of the bigger cornerbacks I've seen. Yeah. And that's what you're looking for out of a bigger cornerback. Because if you're, if you're stiff in the hips, you don't have a good back pedal, then they try to move you to safety. <laughs> mm -hmm. Usually. Exactly. Exactly. So that, so uh, with, again, he, he's not as experienced as some of the other corners in the class. But I think his upside is there, and I think the ball production could come if he gets on the field for a substantial amount of time. So you're looking at Kyrie Jackson probably, I would say he's probably a late round two, early round three pick. I remember starting the process, a lot of people talked about him as an early day four pick. Mm -hmm. He has some buzz. He generated some buzz after the combine. Didn't run as fast as I thought he would. I thought he would run in the four threes. He didn't, but if you look at his play speed on tape, you can see the speed is there for him. So I think he's a late round two, early round three player that the Reds can consider if they want a, a guy who could potentially push for a starting job on the outside. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's where you have to look. I mean, as a third, especially especially if he falls to the third round, uh, and the Raiders can get there and and get him would be would be pretty remarkable if they've taken care of the other needs, especially. Um, Mo, what do you look at as far as so so we're talking solidly third round. When we start to talk about the fourth, fifth round, you might have guys that might not be uh, day one starters. They could be. You never know uh, with as deep as the class is. But but who passed? the Kyrie Jacksons of the world in that solid third round or maybe low third round, fourth round. Who else are you looking at? Max Melton at our Rutgers. Uh, mm. His brother plays for the Green Bay Packers, Bo Melton. He's a wide receiver. So if Max mm. Melton needs some uh, pointers on how to catch a football, he can just ask <laughs> his older brother. <laughs> who's with the Green Bay Packers, made some plays this past season. But Max Melton, I believe he has eight interceptions in the last year, so I don't think he'll need those pointers. He has the ball production. He's a, he's a feisty defender, and I think that's something that will will appeal to Antonio Pierce. He wants some tough guys, even in the secondary. And if he does, Max Melton fits that mold. And I, and I they had a recent tweet uh, post on the X and I said, guys that I think fit the Raiders system or fit the mold of what Antonio Pierce wants, because I, I want to reiterate this. Antonio Pierce wants a certain type of player, regardless if it's at running back, yeah. cornerback, linebacker. He wants a certain mentality in that locker room. And I think Max Milton, uh, Melton fits it to a T. Yeah, uh, and another guy, and and I'm wearing my my Notre Dame shirt today uh, because I I'm picking this guy. Of course, I got to pick somebody. Notre, no, actually, actually, 
you're talking fourth round, maybe even into the top of the fifth round, a guy, Cam Hart out of Notre Dame, 6'2", 200 pounds. The senior bowl, man, he was on fire at the senior bowl. He's one of those freakish athlete guys again, right? So so I'm not saying this is a guy, Cam Hart, you get him in the fifth round that he's going to come in or bottom of the fourth. He's going to come in and start right away. But I like what he has. I've never seen a a a a cornerback mo at that size with a larger wingspan like he puts his it's unbelievable what he does he reminds me a little bit remember byron jones of the dolphins yes yeah he kind of reminds me of byron jones the issue with cam hart is he's stuck he's built on top he's got those large arms and then his legs he like he tapers like a v right yeah. so he needs he needs bottom end strength and conditioning so, uh, but I think he's a guy late if you're looking and you have, because the Raiders obviously have those six, fifth, six, seventh round picks, you know, depending where he goes, he could be a guy that you bring in development. They need a starter. So, so that, you know, this is, this is as we're getting later in the draft and you're looking to fill some spots with guys who might be worth the flyer. Uh, but he's a guy I like too, not just because he went to Notre Dame, but, but he's just, he's so put together up top. It's just that bottom half he's got to work on. Yeah, he's got maybe got to work on that base so he has some balance there. Balance exactly. himself out. But if there's a player that you speak about the fifth round. Yeah. There's a player I mentioned recently uh, in Renardo Green out of Florida State who I started to take a liking to. And there were mm -hmm. other people out there that started to look at some Renardo Green film and, and like him. Now, he may be – maybe he's better suited for man coverage. I think he mm -hmm. can do both man and zone coverage uh, because it's – and I mentioned man zone coverage quickly, briefly, because the Raiders last this past season, there there's some uh, ch there's some charting done out there from the analysts and show that the Raiders have played more cover three last year, yes. which is similar to what Gus Bradley ran when he was defensive coordinator for the Raiders. And it helped uh, that defense. So if you're looking for cornerbacks just in general, I think you want to lean toward cornerbacks who played in zone heavy systems. Mm -hmm. So if you want, we didn't talk about him, you know, extensively, but Quinion Mitchell played in the zone heavy system at Toledo. Yes. So that's why he's popping up as a possible option. I think Terry on Allen could do both play zone and man, of course, most teams will, will implement both, but mm -hmm. I think the Raiders are going to be mostly a zone heavy uh, coverage team. And, and I think Renardo green, if he could do both could be a fit in, in the uh, fourth or fifth round. And I think, I think Mitchell would be the perfect fit for the Raiders. It's just unfortunate that they have other needs they got to take care of in the first round uh, because, mm -hmm. and, and to your point about Telesco's history too. So, so it's, it's unfortunate. He's going to be a good player. I really think he's going to transition well into the NFL, but there's been bigger surprises, Mo. You never know. Yeah. You never, never know. know. You have a defensive coach. So, <laughs> hey, he, maybe he's got the influence. You never know. And I put this out on Sports Not uh, today, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I said that even though Telesco's history is what it is, doesn't really go for cornerbacks in the first round, you also have to look at who's available in value. If you can get arguably the best cornerback in the draft at 13, and let's say the top tackles are off the board, or you think Michael Penix is going to be available in the second round, you might take a cornerback and say, well, we'll take the best cornerback at 13 in the middle of the first round. Yeah. And then hope that we can get Michael Penix in the second round. If not, we'll go in another direction. So you have to also look at value and who's available for you. So I wouldn't, while I don't think it's going to happen with a quarterback at 13, I, I, I would be naive to say it's not a possibility. What I see too, uh, Mo, from our listeners and our viewers is a lot of apprehension if that were to happen because of the Damon Arnett's, because of the Conley's, right? The Raiders have had, have had trouble when they've, when they've drafted early cornerbacks. Okay. And so it, you got to go back a ways to find one that's good. And then overall in the NFL, a lot of people make the argument and they have some data to support them, which is, you know, taking a cornerback that high, unless you're a team on the cusp of, you know, just being a Super Bowl champion and you just need that one piece is difficult. So we'll see. But to your point, the value there, if you can get the best player available and you're, you're staring at a Quinion Mitchell at 13, which I doubt, but if you are, could happen. Yeah, it's a tough decision, man. It's not easy being a GM. <laughs> when you, you people think it's easy, but it's not. It's not Madden, right? So we'll see what they do. People are afraid to take a cornerback at 13 because of what's happened in the past. Just remember, Tom Telesco didn't make those picks. Exactly. <laughs> you got a whole new GM, That's you know, so you, you can't put, you know, the, the apprehension on Tom Telesco when it was Mike Mayock or 
Reggie McKenzie making the picks. So it's not Reggie McKenzie and Mike Mack anymore. It's Tom Telesco. Right. And that's where I, I was chatting with some viewers on Tuesday's show, and they were talking about the, the what they felt was the, the, the that the Raiders didn't need offense or defensive linemen, excuse me, inside. Well, they have Byron Young. And I said, yeah, remember, Tom Telesco didn't take those guys. Yes, they're under right. contract, but the, 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 the guaranteed money is not a big deal with those guys. So, yes, they might seem to have a log jam there, but two, three, maybe even four of those guys, you don't know. They could be gone. I doubt it's four, but – but I don't, I don't see all those guys sticking around. Shoot, Scott, um, Dave Ziegler traded away his own fourth round pick within a year. Remember, <laughs> Neerfeld Jr. was traded to the yeah, Chiefs, so it lasted Chiefs. a year. So, yeah. you know, new GMs, as you said, new GMs come in, they 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 want their flavor of player, and they, they don't have any allegiance or ties to the previous regime's player. So you never know who's on the way in, who's on the way out. Yes. All right. Well, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to get to the safeties. Not a great class in safeties. If I'm giving it a grade, I'm saying CC minus even maybe. That's, this that year. might be generous. <laughs> yes, that might be generous. I'm, might I'm be trying a D to class of safeties. I'm trying. I'm trying to be positive, Mo. <laughs> uh, but when we come back. We're going to get into safeties. Could the Raiders use a safety late in the draft? Maybe yeah. we'll see. They could. You know, you never know. You got depth is a big deal in the NFL, so you can never have too many. Uh, but when you're addressing a lot of needs or at least a few big ones. You got to focus on those first, which I know the Raiders will do. All right, we're going to take that break. When we come back, we're going to talk about safeties. You're with Mo. You're with Scott. This is Silver and Black Today. Welcome back. Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Scott Branson, Mo Moten with you, talking about defensive backs as we do our Raiders draft preview. Do us a favor, if you would, please. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. If you've subscribed for a while, and you're on an Apple iPhone, which a lot of you are, we can see from the data, uh, Apple changed its rules. So if you subscribed a long time ago, uh, listen, go there and make sure that you're still getting the show. Make sure you play the show, because if you play the show, they'll keep your subscription. After a while, it'll fall off. It's Apple's way of, I guess, trying to keep your phone clean or whatever it is. But anyway, please go subscribe wherever you get it. And we would appreciate that. If you're watching us on YouTube, we thank you for the subscription, the thumbs up, and don't forget, Hit the notifications bell. That way, every time we have a premiere show or we have a live show, a special show, whatever's going on, you're going to get a notification. So we thank you for that. Okay. We're going to get into the safeties. And we talked about before the break that not a great safety class. <laughs> a great safety class. Um, you got some of the guys at the top of the, the class and their first, second rounders like Tyron Newbit, Tyler Newbin out of Minnesota, just to name one guy. So when we look at this, we're clearly looking at guys uh, later in the draft, uh, third, fourth round, perhaps, at least the guys that I that I chose to focus on when I was doing my research. But these are these are opportunities for the Raiders to maybe get some depth at safety. When you look at safety for the Raiders currently on the roster, Mo, what do you see as a need for what they lack if they do lack anything? I, I know some old school Raider fans would like a thumper at the linebacker position, but I think we talked about this a lot of times in today's NFL, that thumper linebacker type player is probably a safety now, <laughs> probably a <laughs> exactly. six, three, six, four, 200 plus pound safety. So it's a, it's a more athletic league. So you get the, the bigger, slower two down thumper linebackers off the field and you get a safety that has some zone coverage ability. And I think that's what, um, if you're the Raiders, you're looking for. Now, Trayvon Merrick uh, took some steps last year, and I think he's their deep cover safety. But if you're looking at a replacement for Marcus Epps, who I believe has one more year on his deal, I think the Raiders could use a tone setter at the safety position who can also drop down and play linebacker in sub packages. And I think that's something they should be interested in as a, as a, as a person who could possibly match up with a tight end. So maybe you're looking at, again, a 6'3", 6'4", 210, 220-pound safety who – who can not only tackle and hit, but also cover a little bit in the middle of the field. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it, that that to me is exactly the need there. And I look at some of this, and one of the guys, uh, well, I'm going to let you go first this time because I went first last time. So when we look at that level, knowing that this is not, let's face it, this is a subpar mm -hmm. class for safeties. When you look down the line, who are you seeing? There's one name I particularly focused on, and I won't say Tyler New because he's arguably the best safety <laughs> in the class. Uh, if Stoic Raider is listening to me, cover your ears, Stoic Raider, because I'm mentioned I'm mentioning a Washington State Cougar. Right oh yes, now. I know who this is. 
Jaden Hicks, I think yeah. he's the guy. I yeah. think he's the guy that when I said a tone setter, he is a solid tackler, not only a solid tackler, a reliable tackler, a controlled tackler, not a reckless tackler, as we saw with John Abrams in recent years. You know, it's one thing to have a safety who loves to hit, but you want that, you don't want that guy drawing penalties. You want him to be able to wrap up and just make the play and move on to the next play. And I think uh Jaden Hicks is that guy. Uh, man coverage may not be his strong suit, but it's not the strong suit of many linebackers and safeties these days. But in zone coverage, I think he can cover the shallow areas of the field and the seams against tight ends and handle that position pretty well. Now, again, he's a tone setting safety. You're not going to, yes. he may play in deep coverage in a pinch, but uh, being closer to the box, closer to the line of scrimmage is what he does best. And that's his strong suit. Yes. And he's also very aggressive in the blitz. Um, yes. And so as a pass rusher, too, to your point about, you know, how how these safeties have sort of taken over some of the role that you used to having from a linebacker, it's good. Mm -hmm. But but I think the ball hawking skills are there, too. Uh, mm -hmm. And and he's got the ability to turn quickly, I think, in those routes with the, when you look at um, um, NFL modern NFL offenses and what he's able to do, the kind of understanding of that that spatial um awareness. relationship and awareness mm -hmm. like you said is is huge so i think that yes jaden hicks man i mean he was number one on my list too i think a good fit there as well for me the other guy that i looked at um uh, actually i got two i got one i got one guy that that i think is behind hicks and then i got another kind of dark horse for later but um is is kalen bullock a usc 62 195 here's a guy another good i know this is a theme for me today strong tackler but very instinctual with his play recognition as well. He also is good on special teams. So there's a guy that, you know, if you're going to draft somebody that low, they're going to play safety. But you also, if you're going to make the roster as a guy like that, you're going to have to be able to do that too. He's also the one thing too, I saw some interviews with USC and USC did not have a good year on defense. So some of his numbers went down a little bit. I, yeah. that's, that's, I know I'm being generous there too. Um, <laughs> but he, he, two things stuck out at me when they were interviewing, uh, uh, Riley about the coach about, about him for like a post game or a pregame, excuse me, that I saw on YouTube was the, uh, the idea that he is a, he's a vocal leader, right? So you mad, he likes to take charge on the field. He's like a coach, uh, out there. And also he, ma he has made his propensity to make big plays at big times. So late in games on big third downs. So he's got the knack to be in the right place at the right time. So he's a guy too. I don't know if you, you, you uh, look much at him, Mo, but I think he's a guy to keep an eye on. Yeah, I'll go with you. I'll go with you on that. Like I, said, I didn't dig super deep into the safeties class <laughs> only because I just, you know, beyond maybe three or four guys, you're just yeah. like, all right, you know, most of these safeties are going to be special teams players. If they touch the field, and a lot of people have asked me, you know, about what's going to happen with Chris Smith and Isaiah Polamalu, who the Raiders did resign. Yep. And I think Isaiah Polamalu is worth mentioning because he could be one of those hybrid linebacker safety players that the Raiders choose to develop rather than draft a safety in this class in the, you know, third or fourth round. But, you know, if you're if you're looking at it and saying, OK, Third to fifth round is is the stretch where we can get a safety and possibly get someone who's stepping in for Marcus Epps. I think both choices that we brought up today were pretty good, pretty good options. Yeah, and dark horse late round pick, or maybe I I, I think he'll go probably in the fifth ish. Is Cole Bishop at Utah too? Another guy that I just yeah. like because he's got an incredible motor um, and uh, d did really well at the line of scrimmage too. So here's another guy that if you need to come up and play, in essence like a linebacker he's 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 definitely fits that bill but he's a guy again he's a guy that that you you look at as a project but but i think he's got the skill set and i think he'll make it in the nfl i really do another good tackler another guy who when you get close to the line of scrimmage too he's very good at getting through traffic there um but i i really didn't know much at all about him i've always liked utah's defense but i didn't know much about cole bishop and so i started preparing for the show and i started watching i'm like man this guy's kind of a nut I love it. So there's there's one more name for you. Again, the, the 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 safety class is not good. So we're we're giving you the best that we can. That's why this segment won't be very long. No, we'll get we'll get to calls here in a second. And we don't want Raider fans yelling at us to saying the Raiders don't need safety. So we, we, we can't have that either, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, we we can't do that. Uh that would not be good. All right. Well, we're gonna do uh anything else on safeties, Mo. No, absolutely not. <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> I'm sure There's our listeners. One. Go ahead. That that's run um Taylor, that's run Taylor Demerson out of Texas Tech. Another, I guess, throw not a throwaway name, but a guy who had some ball production. Mm -hmm. He allowed three touchdowns and had four interceptions this past season. Cleaned up. He had a lot of missed tackles in his first uh, in 2021, 2022. Cleaned that up. I think he's another name. Uh, he'll be he'll be initialized as DDT, DTD. And uh, if you're his name, just know that he can he can play deep safe, play deep safety and also come up and uh, make a tackle. As I said, cleaned up his tackling technique so he could be used as a as a strong safety or a free safety if the team chooses to pick him up in the middle rounds. Yeah. And, and a lot of these guys at safety, especially if, you know, if the Raiders take a safety late in the draft and you're like, what are they doing? It, it's a guy comes in and, and it could be a one year deal. See if he works out. If he doesn't, you know, see you later. It doesn't cost you a ton of money. Uh, and so we'll see what happens, but we'll, uh, we're, we're trying to get to all the positions, whether you think they need them or not. Depth is important. Uh, of course the Raiders have other pressing needs, so we'll get, We'll get to uh, your calls coming up here as we conclude our coverage of the Raiders draft preview at safety, the defensive backs. We've now completed that. When we come back, we're going to get to our phone calls. Yes, you can call into the show, leave a voicemail, and we'll get to you. We've got a couple of surprises there, too, as well as uh, interesting take, uh, Mo, when we come back from the break. Mel Kuyper Jr., which I know people out there just absolutely love him. Either people like him or hate him. It's like a weird thing. But he did his latest mock draft. We're not a big mock draft show, but I do want to talk about the 12th and 13th picks, uh, which include the Raiders. We'll get to that here in a second. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. We are coming back right after these words. Raider Nation is never shy. You ask, we answer. It's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. What's on your mind, fam? Drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Now, it's your time to speak up. Yes, it's your time to speak up. Be heard, America. Be heard, Raider Nation. Let's go. <laughs> I always wanted a voiceover. Remember... Again, I might I age myself here. But Super Friends. You, did you ever watch Super Friends? Never watched Super Friends. Okay. Well, it was, you know, it was basically Batman, Superman, Wonder mm -hmm. Woman, Aquaman. Mm -hmm. Basically what became the Avenger type of thing. Oh, that's yep. DC. That's uh, that's uh, Marvel, not DC. So, but the, the guy who did the voiceovers on it was one of those old school boys. And at the Hall of Justice, you know. And it's funny because here in Cincinnati, the, the the building that is the Hall of Justice in the cartoon is actually the old train station in Cincinnati because the guy who drew it was from Cincinnati, the Hall of Justice. And now it's a museum. But very funny. I, the first time I came to Cincinnati, I went, oh, my gosh, it's the Hall of Justice. <laughs> it's real. No. Anyway. OK, enough cartoons from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> We're back. Silver and black today. Mo and Scott with you. <laughs> By the way, follow Mo on X.com. At Mo Moton, M O E M O T O N. I am at LV Gully. By the way, this is the mailbag. People are not emailing us as much, which is cool because we have a phone number 702 900, 702 900 7869. That's 702 900 7869. Leave your message for next week's show. We'll get, we'll get it on the air. And uh, we got some really good calls today, including our buddy Tarek, who always is traveling around, right, Mo? Mm -hmm. Last week he was in Iowa. I think before that he was in Denver, where wherever he was. So he leaves his. Well, I'll wait till we get to the call. Okay, first we're going to get to um, our calls. I'm going to go to my list here so I, I, I get them right. And I don't screw up who it is. Um, where to go? Okay. So here we go. We're going to go. We're going to start uh, on the West Coast. By the way, seven zero two nine hundred seven eight six nine. Here we go. Hey fellas. Uh, this is Anders from Oakland Anders. again, and uh, not going to talk that much about the draft. I am interested to hear what you guys have to think, have to say about two players, and they're both fast as hell, and, you know, we love speed here in Oakland, uh, and that is Trey Tucker and Julian Ben. So what is it going to take for Tucker to really become the deep threat that I think he should be able to be? Uh, he certainly didn't get that much playing time last year, but is there some hope for him to actually be, you know, a solid two or a solid three uh, on that offense uh, in that receiving core 
And what does he need to do, does he need to do to get there? And Bennett is so intriguing to me. I think that, you know, he's super fast, but he didn't show much his first year. And from what I understand, and I'm not that knowledgeable, but from what I understand, the transition from college to the pros at cornerback can be really tricky, right? There are the Jacori, I mean, there are the, like, the, the Gonzalez guys who can come in immediately and play well, but it seems like they take a little seasoning before they really can contribute. And what does he need to do? Uh, or is he kind of a lost cause? Like, it's just not going to happen. Because I know you're talking about we need an outside corner really badly. But maybe there's a chance that he can develop a little bit. And what does he need to do? Uh, those are, that's, it. that's it for me. I'd be really curious to hear uh, what you guys think. Thanks again. Great show as always. Anders, thanks, man. I appreciate your call from Oakland, the birthplace of the Raiders. Uh, Mo, start with Ja'Cory and Bennett. Yeah, Ja'Cory Bennett was my guy last year when he came to the training camp. Set felt like he had a chance to start right away. The Raiders gave him a chance, as Andre said, didn't do so well. I think one of the things with a young cornerback that I see a lot they struggle with is getting their head around to the football. So a lot of times, a cornerback, you know, you get to these wide receivers in the, on the pro level, they're you know they're hitting you with double moves, and you don't trust your technique, you panic. So instead of playing the football, you start grabbing, you know, and that's. That was one of the things that I worried about with Jacorian Ben is that he could be too handsy downfield. So you saw penalties early when he was on the field and in a pinch and as his role started to grow before he was benched late in the season. So he had some issues there with, you know, hand fighting down the field, getting his head around. And I think those are two of the things that you hear a lot about with the cornerbacks in, in most classes that you hear a top cornerback say, yeah, he's his coverage is great, but he gets too handsy downfield. You hear that a lot about like, some of the top cornerbacks. In this year's class. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what hurt Jacorian Bennett uh, as a rookie is that he's got to learn to trust his technique. I think Amik Robertson came on our show and said, you got to move with your feet. You got to defend with your feet and not with your hands. Mm -hmm. And I remember I forgot which team did it, but one team had their cornerbacks take the field with boxing gloves on. And if you ever wore boxing gloves, you know, you can't grab a boxing gloves and it forces the it forces cornerbacks to play with more technique and, and, and defend with their feet and not with their hands. And I think that's something that Jacory and Bennett is going to have to work on. The Trey Tucker part of this question is very easy. I mean, Hunter Renfro is no longer with the Raiders, so he's not going to have Renfro sucking up his snaps in the slot. And I think as long as he just gets more opportunities, I think Trey Tucker will be a, you know, a player that you, we would hope he can be as an explosive playmaker over the top. We saw it last year during the preseason, during mm -hmm. the season, when he did get the few opportunities he did get. Now, there were some times where he didn't get his toe drag swag down in, in bounds, so he has to work on his sideline catching. But I think that comes with experience. And I think the more opportunities he gets, he'll show you uh, what he can do with those 40, 50-yard bombs downfield. So I, I'm actually – a lot of people didn't like the pick, including myself with Tr Trey Tucker, but I could see where he could be – you know, a, a 30, 40 catch guy getting 600 yards, you know, not a down to down reliable player like Devontae Adams, and Jacory, uh, Jacoby Myers, excuse me, but the guy that's going to stretch the field and give you those big explosive plays. Yeah. And he did really well. Uh, I, I thought route running when he did have snaps, his, his issue yeah. continues to be, even though he made some great catches is just holding onto the ball. And I think that that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's the biggest thing he's had to work on since he was in college. So if he does that and he gets better at it, and depending who the quarterback is and the the kind of relationship there and the connection there, I think you'll see him. They're going to rely on him, right? Like you said, in the slot with Hunter Renfro gone, um, he's going to be expected to do that. So you got to see him step up, and hopefully he does that. Uh, and and he showed flashes. So we'll see how it goes. Anders, thank you so much, man. We appreciate your call in Oakland. Next, we're going to Raider Izzy. Raider Izzy. What's up, guys? It's Raider Izzy. Um, first time caller listened for a long time, never called in. Um, Scott, I've talked to you a bunch of times on the X um, under my actual handle, not my uh, not my Raider name, like you guys referenced in the last show. So I wanted to kind of throw one out there. So I'm going with Raider Izzy for that one. Um, wanted to uh, chat with you guys a little bit about the draft, obviously. Um, I'm one of those guys that definitely is all in for Jaden Daniels. However, um, I am really talking myself into Michael Penix, and I have a thought I wanted to run by you guys. Obviously, I read that piece that Mo came out with um, in regards to Telesco's tendencies and stuff like that. So kind of putting two and two together here, I wanted to just kind of go in on this Penix idea because I, I love Penix. I think he's, to be honest with you, I think he's more 
a better fit for what we're we're going to be looking to do here than, than Daniels is. I just understand the relationship Daniels has with Pierce, but I get it. So, um, obviously, I do a ton of mock drafts. It's you know, I'm a big draft nerd. It, it's what I do. It's <laughs> you know, it's just a lot of fun for me. So, um, I'm not going to go through a full seven here, but I wanted to run an idea by you for the first four. One, let's say Penix falls right into our lap, which is exactly what happened with Telesco using those tendencies with Herbert. Um, Perfect situation, okay? Round two, instead of going whole line, which I agree we need, obviously, I kind of want to start this off with a bang. I like the idea of Xavier Leggett for for uh, Penix and for our offense. We need a vertical threat, a bigger <laughs> vertical threat to go along with it. I know it's nowhere near. I shouldn't say need. We, we kind of want that. I know it's not a need per se, but I think that would be an awesome fit for our offense, awesome fit for Penix, big vertical arm. Love the idea of like it there in the second round. Third round is when we go after our tackles. So whether it be, um, I love Rosengarten out of out of Washington. I don't think he'll be there in round three. He's always there in his mock dress, but I, I just don't think he's going to be there when it's all said and done. Blake Fisher from Notre Dame is a good one there. Um, Amagechi from from Yale is a good one. You can get a right tackle right there. I, I really still think this draft is that deep in tackle. You can get one there. Fourth round, someone Mo's been talking about, I know, is Kyrie Jackson. I love him for Morgan. Corner. Um, he's a perfect fit for our scheme, too. Big man-to-man guy. A lot of ball production. Not afraid to be kind of scrappy and tackle. Uh, I think those first four, man, that we come out there, we light, light, light it up, man. You set it up with the run game, the deep ball. We can get some running backs later on in the draft. Uh, we're still going to have a lot of money come to first. You know, we're going to be spending a lot there. I think that's a, you know, that, that's a good place to be in, um, especially with not going against the story pick like formula and everything. I, and I, I'm just loving this. But I wanted to throw that idea out to you. Um, oh, there you go. Cut off. Raider Izzy, great call. Mo, going wide receiver in the second round? Yeah. You know what? It's Ooh. funny. I, I know we haven't gotten to the wide receivers yet, yeah. but on my, on my Bleach Report lives. Yeah. And in some of in some of my articles, I said to prepare for the Raiders to draft the wide receiver. If and I think uh, Raider Izzy was referencing referencing it from my article that Tom Telesco has been drafting wide receivers between the third and fifth rounds for quite some time, even with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Now I know Keenan Allen and Mike Williams have had their injury issues, mm-hmm. but you know with those two guys being your one two punch and then and then having you know a, a rotation of guys as your number three wide receiver Tom Telesco has you know had guys in and out there Joshua Palmer is probably the most known because he had his opportunity to play a lot when Allen and Mike Williams for the most part were out this past season but Raider Nation prepare for the Raiders to draft the wide receiver I don't know if they'll go as early as the second round as very easy says but who knows I wouldn't be surprised if they do go there because and I think we've said this too that, and we agree with Raider Izzy here that the Raiders need some speed on the perimeter. Yeah, Absolutely. they have Trey Tucker in the slot, but he's mostly a slot wide receiver. Right. Where's the speed going to come from on the perimeter? Now Devontae Adams is great, but is you know not known as a speed guy, but right. he can get the ball downfield. But I think if you're drafting Michael Penix, and I like the idea that that Raider Izzy brought up here is that if you're drafting a Michael Penix who has that deep ball accuracy. You want to be able to have him utilize that skill, that part of his skill set, right? So yeah. you don't want to have a, a deep ball throw and have one deep threat, right? Yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna draft some speed at wide receiver. So I think while the idea to a lot of people will seem far fetched in the second round, I wouldn't be surprised if the Raiders go with a wide receiver at some point on day two to add some speed to that offense. Now get to the rest of his mock draft. We just spoke about Kyrie Jackson. I just spoke about Kyrie Jackson as a player that can go. On day two, second, third round, Amagaji's a guy. I didn't, and, and Amagaji and uh, Blake Fisher are guys we didn't mention during our tackle rundown, but those are guys that are going to probably be available on day two. He mentioned also uh, Roger Rosengarten, shout out to a great another dog. Uh, but you said it, I think, when we ran down our tackles that this is a D class with tackles. So if they don't get one, let's say in the first, second round, there are going to be some guys who could be available in the third round that they could plug in and possibly start right away. And that's where that's where I want to caution folks who who aren't big like Raider Izzy. By the way, for a first call, fantastic. I mean, yeah. amazing call. Knock it out for the, the first time. Great one. Mm-hmm. Um, is that 
if the Raiders, yes, the uh, tackle is a massive need and pr- number one need, number two need, depending who you talk to. I still think quarterbacks number one, but anyway, doesn't mean you have to get that person in the first or second round. And Izzy talked about that right there, right? I think that's mm-hmm. an important thing. So don't freak out if they don't take an offensive tackle in the first or second round, because there are plenty in this class. If it was a different class and you only had five really good tackles and that was it, then I understand. Again, the market, the need, and the value changes your perspective there. So we'll see how it all unfolds. But Raider, S- go ahead. Scott, I'll say, th- I'll say this too. Offensive tackle and cornerback are very similar in this way that those are probably two of the deepest positions in this draft class. And those are, and those are coincidentally two positions that the Raiders are probably going to address. Mm-hmm. So if the Raiders go with a certain position in round one, oh my gosh, we're not going to get a starter. If it's offensive tackle or cornerback, as <laughs> we've will. been saying, yeah. you could probably get one in day two or day, or day three. And, and it's cool that Raider Izzy brought up uh, some of those names there. Amagachi, yeah. pretty interesting that he <laughs> – Smart guy, right? Yeah. Out of Yale, and I believe he was interning at some uh, at a you know he one of those you know Wall Street type jobs. Yeah, and he's like gonna and he's like going into the NFL. You know he's gonna be a you know a day you know top a day two pick maybe. Yeah. How and people are saying how interesting is that that you're you know guy is interning and then he's just preparing for an NFL career in in the months ahead. So smart guy, I believe he's played both sides of the line so you can if he's not a starter on the right side he could be a swing tackle mm-hmm. interesting prospect so yeah keep a keep an, keep an eye out for that name there you go awesome raider is he great all right now we're getting to our good buddy Tarek, who calls in almost every show and guess where he is this week mo <sighs> somewhere in, somewhere in illinois no he's in cincinnati Ah, so I might go meet Tarek for a beer we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll tell you about that after that happens here we go here's Tarek. Good evening, Scott and Mo. How are you guys? This is Carrick checking in with you guys from Cincinnati. Hope you gentlemen are well. Uh, just uh, continuing the discussion about the draft, uh, the expression paralysis by overanalysis sort of comes into play. <laughs> uh, you know, analysts are all over the place. And, you know, I think my final prediction, you guys, is the Raiders going to attempt to move up to three or four to get J.D. Daniels. If they fail to do that, they're going to go with Penix at number 13 if he's available. If he's not available at 13, I think they're going to go cornerback or offensive tackle. Um, I want your thoughts about drafting Penix at 13. I hesitate to take a quarterback who is going to be 24 years old next month, has a history of injuries in college. Uh, if he does pan out, I'll be the first one to uh, eat my words. Um, I know that uh, a lot of Raider fans, when uh, when the Raiders sign guard Minshew, are like, oh, the second coming of Stabler because of his hair. Uh, absolutely not. Um, the expression, win, lose, or tie, Raiders till I die. You need to remove the lose part out of there because there's been, there's been far too much of it. But uh, I want to know what you think about taking Penix. Um, it looks like he is their plan B in the first round. Um, I, I, I know he has, he has been injury free for a couple years now, but it's still kind of a red flag. Uh, by the way, Mo, um, you do absolutely look like Kurt Morrison. And Scott, <laughs> I'm not so sure that I'm younger than you. I'll be 51 next month. Uh, I hope yes. you guys have a great week. I'm looking forward to your shows this week. And I'll talk to you guys again really soon. Go Raiders. All right. Bye-bye. My, my guy, Tarek, here in Cincinnati. Hopefully going to see him. And yes, Tarek, you're still younger than me. So there you go. But um, I want to start with this one, Mo, because I have, I'm have i working on a piece for Sports Not on Penix. But um, a couple of things Tarek brought up there about his reservations with Penix. So the injury thing. That was a big deal going to the combine. He goes to the combine. Injury stuff checks out. I understand it. What I don't understand is that, well, he's going to be 24. Folks, do you know how old Aiden O'Connell was last year? 24. 24. So what? Nobody mentioned Aiden O'Connell's age. And he's not a top quarterback. Like, And and you look at a lot of these quarterbacks with the transfer portal, with COVID, a lot of the quarterbacks and a lot of the players coming out now are 23, 24 years old because they have an extra two years in essence. Some of these guys, and obviously Penix with the injury when he was at Indiana, all that stuff. So you understand that. So the age doesn't concern me. I'm looking at the tape. I'm looking at the skill set. And I said it last show, I'm in favor of them. If he's there at 13 or if they really love him and they can move up a couple spots, you go get him. Cause I think that the quarterback position, I think Penix, he's not perfect. 
no quarterback in this draft is perfect, but I do think the opportunity for them to go get a quarterback and maybe his career is a few years shorter because of the injuries late on the end of his career. So be it. You get, you get nine, 10 years out of him. Oh, well, you know, I, I just think though that Mo, yes, offensive tackle, but we just talked about how deep the class is. So if you're there at 13 and there's a quarterback like Penix with the, the ability that he has, I think it's a no brainer. So here's where I'll go with, with Tarek's call. So one, uh, thanks for hopping on the Mo Moten, Kirk Morrison bandwagon. <laughs> a lot of people are pushing that now. Uh, <laughs> but I had an extensive conversation with a lot of folks, and and the Michael Penix discussion is top of the top of the mountain right now, top of the list. And I've said this multiple times now. I wouldn't move up for Michael Penix because there are a lot of people out there now that believe Michael Penix could be going in the top 10. I don't think I don't think he's going to be picked in the top 10 for the reason that one of the reasons that Turk brought up the injury history. If Michael Penix had a fully healthy collegiate career, I think he's a top 10 pick Absolutely, because he has the arm talent. He has the processing. He's a full field reader. He has all the intangibles that you would want in a quarterback and the leader of your offense. But we can't wipe out the injury history. Yes, he's been healthy over the last two years. So you have to give him credit for that. But. You know, those are those were major injuries. You know, these are knee injuries. I believe he's shoulder issue too. So you can't erase that from his history. And I think that's gonna scare some teams away. Yeah. Now, if you're picking him at 13, what it tells me is for the Raiders is that they're not too worried about the injury history. They're willing to roll the dice and say, if we get 10 good years of Michael Penix, and you said it, quarterbacks now play into their mid to late 30s. So if he's 24 and you get Michael Penix till he's 34, I I, I believe that's a good decade, you don't have to worry about the quarterback position if he's mostly healthy. I'll, I would take that. I would sign up for 10 years of Michael Pence if you told me he's he's not going to miss many games. Mm -hmm. Now, I will also say that, and I'm going to say this very clearly, be very careful, be very careful about players who pick up draft buzz weeks before the actual draft. There are a lot of smoke screens out there. Am I saying now? I'm one of the people that's that said from day one, even before the Texas win you know, over um, Washington beating Texas and the college football playoff, I said that Michael Penix to me is a back end first round pick, mm -hmm. and the injuries are going to knock him down a bit. But you know, as Tarek said, the the the, the, the discourse, the analysis by paralysis or whatever you want to call it, has been all over the place. Penix has gone from a first round pick, then he's a second, third round pick after the loss to Michigan, then he's a first round pick again after his pro day. If the Raiders feel like he's a franchise quarterback, take him at 13, I would understand the logic. But I'm of the belief that the Raiders can get the tackle who will protect Penix and still get Penix in the back end of the first round if they're able to trade up. I also think there's a possibility that Penix could be available at the beginning of the second round and you could pull it, you could pull what the Tennessee Titans did last year when they moved up for Will Levis. And he, they picked him as the second pick in the second round. So that that mid to late first round to early second round range is where I have Michael Penix. Though, like Tarek, I wouldn't have a problem with the Raiders choosing him at 13 because what, what it would tell me is they think he's a franchise quarterback. And if you think someone is a franchise quarterback, go and get him. Yeah, and I look, I look at to your point about Penix being there, maybe bottom of the first, top of the second. I the one team that I keep talking to or thinking about after talking to Ryan Dyerud over at LA Football Network is um the Rams. Rams. I think the Rams, I don't know that he would get past the Rams. So if you're the Raiders, you got to think about that. I think that's really the only threat. Somebody, oh, Seattle, Seattle. Well, that makes sense because he went to school in Washington. I just don't see it, but I do see the Rams who are looking down the line and needing a quarterback too, maybe not right away or as immediate need as the Raiders have, but in Sean McVay's system and what they do there, he would be a f perfect fit there too. So, so we'll see. But like you said, if they like him there or if they can get into the bottom of the first round and he's still there, then you might be able to get two birds with one stone, so to speak, uh, your tackle and then your quarterback. But like you said, if you think he's going to be the guy, then you take him at 13. So a few quick things. The connection with Michael Penix to the Seahawks, I understand because Ryan Grubb is now their offensive coordinator. Right. And Ryan Grubb was in Washington with Michael Penix. I get the connection there. A lot of people bring it up. But let's remember, they acquired Sam Howell. And in, and in that trade with the Washington Commanders, they gave up a third-round pick. Yes. So Sam Howell is their developmental quarterback. And the Seattle Seahawks don't have a second-round pick. So if they don't address their needs in the first round, they're waiting to the third round 
to address their needs. I think they're I think it's more like the, that Seattle trades back rather than draft Michael Penix. The other thing, the two spots that I think the Raiders, if the Raiders are going to trade back into the first round, the, there are two spots I think they have to, two teams that I think they have to get ahead of. You mentioned it, the Rams, so, uh, who pick at 19. So I think they will have to get ahead of the Rams, get 18, 17, whoever is in those spots. But the Bengals are 18. Bengals. Also yeah. the Vikings. If the Vikings don't bundle their two first round picks to, to move up for a quarterback and then they don't choose a quarterback at 11, the Vikings could choose Michael Penix at 23, so I would want to get ahead of the Vikings at 23, and I would call the Eagles, who have the 22nd pick, and try mm. to jump over the Vikings. Yeah, and and I was mentioning, uh, and Tarek, again, thanks for your call, buddy. I hope I get to see you while you're in town. Um, the, the the Mel Kuyper, the, his latest draft I thought was interesting because he had, and I think this is sort of conventional thinking, he had the Vikings trading up with the Chargers to five and taking J.J. McCarthy, which I think is very possible. And you talk about draft smoke screen the jj mccarthy could go number one i've been seeing that i'm like get out of here uh but then oh, but then they in this draft they have quinion mitchell going to the broncos one spot ahead of the raiders by the way uh and then they have your guy fuaga with the raiders so yes so there you go fuaga so, is the fuaga is the ideal pick i have this piece up on sports not my top five options at 13 for the raiders fuaga yeah. to me is the ideal pick for them He's a position fit. He's a schematic fit. He's a fit attitude wise that what he brings to that offensive line. Fuaga for me is the pick. But if he's not available as well as the top tackles, then as Turk said, you may go with Michael Panks to get the quarterback. There you go. All right. Now we're going on to Travis in San Diego. Here's Travis. Hey guys, this is Travis from 619 San Diego. Um, I just wanted to talk about the draft like everybody else. <laughs> um, I know. I hear a big thing about everybody wanting to get a right tackle and then trading up to get Michael Penix. <laughs> but honestly, I would think I would go a different route. I think the best thing to do is to maximize Max Crosby's potential. And by doing that, adding more D-line depth and talent would do that. So I would go Byron Murphy from Texas. And I know we probably don't need him. I know, like, the D-line's already stacked, but I think what that's going to do, drafting Byron Murphy, is actually help uh, improve his growth rapidly because well, early on, if he has Christian Wilkins and Max Crosby, you're talking about a lot of one-on-one -on -one opportunities for him and Malcolm Coots. So I think adding more talent to the D-line, similar to what the 49ers did where they were drafting D-line every single year, it seemed like, um, I think D-line is the way to go. And I get the need for tackle. I completely understand a tackle holding down one side of the field. But my thing is there are ways around that. And that's uh, providing help to him on uh, with a tight end, Michael Mayers. And before we were like, oh, okay, well, we don't want a tight end to be in all the time. Bears were one of the top teams to run 12-man personnel and 21-man personnel. Both of those personnel involve having a tight end on the field. And they were top 10 on both of those. So there will be a tight end on the field. And it, it would be real easy to, I wouldn't say easy, but if we had a tackle that was struggling, having a tight end there to help chip and help in that way, that's the way to neutralize the pass rush and to help out a, a young tackle if we were to draft them in the second or third round. But getting Byron Murphy, I think, would create wonders for the whole entire D-line. They would be young, there would be depth, they would be hungry, and if, God forbid, somebody went down, we would have somebody to step up and take their place. So I want your guys' thoughts on getting Byron Murphy. I get the need for tackle, but I want to maximize Crosby's potential and Wilkins, and I think adding more talent to the D-line, especially with that 13 overall pick, I think that would help a lot. All right, thanks, guys. All right, there's Travis in San Diego. Really well thought out, and the logic mm -hmm. is good. I'm not going to at all play with the logic, but my 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 gut reaction just is how are you going to score points, right? Because, yes, you can have a great defense, but the you looked last year, the last half of the season, the reason the Raiders were just 5-4, and four, one game above 500, was they couldn't score points. So the defense, and I agree with him. I don't think that the, the defensive line's as stacked as you think it is. Like we said earlier, you could still use some some depth, but 
But I get what he's saying because it it it, would, it feels good to say, hey, you know what? Let's double down. Let's make this defense so vicious and so good. But then if you're only scoring 19 points a game, and he mentioned the Bears, the Bears were 19th in scoring. So, again, you need to have – that's why we focus not only on the tackle but on the quarterback too and even wide receiver because – I think the Raiders can get better on defense too, like Travis is saying, but they don't need a Byron Murphy to do it necessarily. Travis, you have a bunch of Raider fans saying, yelling at you saying that the Raiders don't need a defensive tackle. And I know uh, we joke about that because that's what was said during our show about defensive linemen. I get the logic. I totally understand yeah, the absolutely. logic. I, you know, it, it, it makes sense, but I, I, and I think I mentioned this in the, in my last sports not piece that came out today that when you're drafting play these players and a lot of people say BPA best play available. And, and I think that's oversimplifying not that Travis is doing this, but the mm -hmm. people who yell, just take the best player available, regardless of position, regardless if you don't need the position or if you need the position or not, understand that these general managers weigh position need. And after the Raiders just spent what they spent on Christian Wilkins, giving him that, massive deal I, he's going to be on the field most of the time mm -hmm. and then as we said byron murphy may be in the rotation maybe not they re-signed john young. jenkins byron young byron yeah. murphy byron so young we may be in the rotation <laughs> we we're talking about him they re-signed adam butler they re-signed john jenkins tyree wilson may play inside in a pinch how are you getting all of these players snaps and you want to you, you want to talk about maximizing your talent. If you're picking a player in the first round defensive tackle, you want that player to be on the field. Yes, a whole lot. And I don't I don't I just question whether they'll be able to maximize their investment in a first round defensive tackle with what they already have. So when you pick that player, that first player in the first round, you want to you want you want that player to make an immediate impact. You want him to be on the field. For most of the snaps, if you take a defensive tackle, he may not be on the field for 50 percent of the snaps because of the rotation you have. And that's why I, I prefer while I understand Travis's logic. Mm -hmm. That's why I prefer the Raiders go uh, with an offensive tackle, a quarterback, even a cornerback, even though Tom Sesco's history says he doesn't go for cornerbacks there. You want to be able to maximize that premium pick because the Raiders yeah. only have one first rounder and it's at 13. Or to maximize that that choice. And I get it because you look at teams like San Francisco and how stacked they are. And then you look at teams like even Philadelphia. Yeah. I know they waned at the end of the season, but you look at that defensive line in Philadelphia, you're like, geez, right? So so I get that. You, you, if you can get a player of that caliber, of course, you oh yeah, I would love to have them. But again, the Raiders were 23rd in scoring last year. The offense clearly, yes, they need to supplement the defense, but they clearly need. Uh, something different on offense. And that starts with not only offensive line, but also quarterback and being able to, and finding out what they're going to do at running back. Can Zamir White do it? Is he the guy? He's going to be in a committee probably. Who's going to be the young guy with him that they go out and get this year? So so lots to do there. But Travis, great call, man. I love the creativity there. And, and hey, you know what? Opinions are awesome. Some people will deride you for them, but I I appreciate your thinking on it, man. It was pretty yeah, cool. I like I like the opinions that people think out of the box. As long as yeah. it's well thought out, which Travis's thought was well thought out and presented, I, I'm all for hearing other other opinions. All right, we got one more call here before we end the show, and of course, we save the best for last. It's Jacob <laughs> from Fresno. Here we go. Here's Jacob. Scat. This is Jacob from Fresno. Hey What's guys. up, guys? It's me. Look, I got some breaking news today. I got some eye peeling. I, I, I can't think of anything else. It's just breaking news. I got it. All right. But uh, I'm not going to be reporting it. Who do you think's going to be reporting it? We're gonna we're gonna Shefter. switch it over to one Adam Shifty Schefter. Here you go, Schefter. According to my sources, there are now very serious reports that the Washington Commanders are now no longer interested in Jaden Daniels after the release of the new picture of Jaden Daniels' <laughs> elbow circulating on X that was first posted by Telescopes Tommy and then retweeted by Panponio Tears. <laughs> it's being rumored that the NFL had reached out to Washington in order to let them know about the liability concerns of Jaden Daniels' pointy elbow. If Jaden Daniels were to get sacked and stick his elbow out 
in the effort to poke a defender in the eye, he would be flagged for personal foul and unnecessary roughness and could possibly even face suspension for attempted assault with a deadly weapon. In a related (sighs) report, Antonio Pierce has let Tom Telesco know that he is not at all worried about the NFL's liability concerns, (laughs) and he reached out to Tom Telesco and said, just go get that diamond wearing, kiss stealing, wheel and dealing, <laughs> limousine riding, jet flying son of a gun. Back to you, Jacob. <clears throat> well, how about that, guys? Oh, my goodness. That's pretty good stuff right uh, there, huh? Boy. I mean, one can only speculate, right? Wow, oh, but the pointy elbow comes in clutch once again. That's That's some good news. I'm looking forward to, you know, Sending them a seventh and then swapping first, right? That seems about fair. Seven, I think seven that's, that's my new. First. That's my new one. That's my new. I cannot think of the word. Oh. Right? I'm about to lose you guys. Prediction. All right. Take it easy, Raiders. <laughs> Jacob in Fresno. Uh. Oh, I'm all red. I'm laughing so hard over here. Holy crap! That was good stuff, man. Yeah, the Jane Daniels, the elbow picture. We talked about that before, but I, I do think. You know, the percentage, I, I think Washington is going to take them. Uh, and I don't think you yeah. know, as much as much as Raider fans would love it. And I know Antonio Pierce would love it. I just don't see it happening, which is why we're focused on who we think will be available. Michael Penix Jr. Uh, and there are some people who talk about Bo Nix. Not so much anymore because he could he's probably going to be second round, top of second round. So we'll see. But uh, Jacob's. Uh, <laughs> Jacob's Adam Schefter, man. Gosh, it's good stuff. We we had to get Adam Schefter to do a Ric Flair woo in there. Woo! We can get yeah, that next exactly. Time. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's funny Jacob <laughs> jokes about this because I did a bleach report live on Monday. And I, you know, I put out potential trade scenarios and how it compares to other trades that that have happened in recent years and even going back to I believe 20 uh 2004 when the Ravens traded up into the first round for Kyle Bowler and what it would cost. And to my surprise, there were there were a good portion of Raider fans who said they wouldn't trade three first rounders for Jaden Daniels. I'm mm-hmm. not that surprised because that's a steep price. But just remember, for the people that want to trade up for Jaden Daniels, that's probably what it's going to cost. If you remember the 49ers trade with the Dolphins before they picked Trey Lance in 2021, they gave up three firsts and a third rounder to mm-hmm. move up from 12 to three. The Raiders would be going from 13 to three. So the price is going to be very similar in which the Raiders are going to have to give up this year's first, <laughs> probably 2025 first that year, and their 2026 first, and probably a middle round pick to move mm. up for Jaden Daniels. Let's say the Washington Commanders and you know they you know they choose Drake May and the Patriots want to trade out. Let's say the Raiders try to move up to three for Jaden Daniels, which is again similar to the the Dolphins uh, 49ers trade. Three first rounders and probably a middle, uh, early middle rounder. That's what it's going to cost. So, for you, Jane Daniels, trade up people out there. Just remember what the price would be. Are you willing to pay that price? You can answer in the chat. Hit me up on DM, Twitter, whatever the case may be. Give me your answers to that one. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, I think if it's the guy you want, you do whatever you have to. But if that's the guy you, I mean, if that's who they believe is going to take them to win a Super Bowl then you do it, but you're, you're kind of pushing all your chips. You're all in like all in because you're giving yeah. up so much capital that you better do it. <laughs> if you don't, you're going to, you're gonna, on the back end, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Whereas again, and I love J- Jaden Daniels, but mm-hmm. on the back end, you get, you wait till 13, you get a guy like Penix and he doesn't work out. It just costs you your 13th pick. That's it. Right. So, so you have to look at it from that perspective, but you know, I get it. Some people do want to go all in and that's fine. All too. In. We'll see what, what Tom Telesco does. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, another great show. We appreciate you guys uh, being with us here again. If you want to call in for the next show, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. If you're watching this, you can see it down there. If you're listening, thank you so much. Mo, let everybody know what you got going Today is Thursday, so we got tomorrow, Friday, and the weekend. What do you have going? As I've mentioned multiple times during the show, over on sportsnot.com, I have a piece out ranking my top five options for the Raiders at pick 13. 
If you've been listening to me long enough, you know I'm in favor of taking a tackle. But I also have a quarterback. You can probably guess who it is on that list. And I also have a <laughs> cornerback. My preference, uh, if the Raiders do go cornerback and surprise me, I have one particular guy they should choose at 13. Also, next Monday or Monday coming up, I'm going to have another Bleach Report live talking about some sleeper targets for the Raiders. Uh, There's going to be some overlap. So if you listen to us here, I'm going to talk about some of those guys in depth on Monday. Probably fourth, fifth rounders, guys that maybe you've overlooked in your mock drafts, guys who've flown under the radar, guys may who've been who may have been hurt in the process of the draft evaluation, so that uh, have been talked about much. But we'll bring them up on Monday, and we and we can possibly talk about some options the Raiders can pick up round three to round six. I will say yes. By the way, just go get the Bleacher Report app if you want to watch Mo. I find that the easiest way. Although now I get to watch Mo on 85 inches of television because the Bleacher Report app on the Roku. If you have a Roku, the Bleacher Report app is cool because you can watch it right there. There you go. Like Kirk I Morrison, it, I, lot, Kirk Morrison I, on, on the big screen. I put it on the other day and my son said, Dad, what, what's Kirk Morrison talking about? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but anyway, good. Make sure you go check that out. Again, 702-900-7869 if you want to get a call on for the next show. I also am going to have a piece on Michael Penix Jr. up on Sports Not. So look for that uh, either tomorrow or on Saturday. And I will tweet it out from both the show. As we do all of our work, Mo's work, my work, you can get it from SNB Today or uh, our channels as well. Mo, my friend, we'll see you next week when we get to talk to Baldy next week. That's going to be fun. Baldy before the draft. I, I know fans love that, love those conversations. He has an interesting take about the Raiders quarterback situation that I've heard, and I, I'm going to have him talk about it when he's on the show. Yes, we're going to talk solely with him about the Raiders' approach to the draft quarterback offensive line the defense all the stuff we talked about we're going to be able to to tap into his great mind about that and uh we're looking forward to that so we're finalizing and he's going to be on next week i don't know if it's going to be a tuesday or thursday show so stay tuned for that but we will look forward to bringing him back on all right do us a favor make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio also on youtube or wherever you're watching us please hit the subscription button notifications bell and the thumbs up we certainly appreciate that for our producer mike robbie former moat and i'm scalpel branson this has been silver and black today uh, odyssey sports original podcast have a great weekend everybody <laughs>